Today, we're taking one bad idea and turning it into two great projects. Okay, that's enough messing around. Let's get to work. Have you ever gotten an idea in the middle of the night, then when you wake up in the morning, you realize how much it sucks? Now, have you ever had an idea, spent $2,200 on materials to make that idea, then realize how much your idea sucks? Well, we've done both. Hey, Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Yeah. Pleasure doing you. See you on the internet. That's right. yep. A couple months ago, we purchased two big elm slabs that we wanted to make into a big dining table and a smaller coffee table. That was the idea, at least. The part that sucks is that as we started to search for the right layout, we struggled to get something that we really liked. We also figured that we would have to hack into both slabs way more than we first thought to get the dining table size we wanted, and then that wouldn't have left us much for a second piece. It's not leaving us any... It leaves us with a big long chunk. Yeah. So what do you do when an idea sucks? Well, we decided to pivot and make two big coffee tables instead. One was the round table you might have seen us make a few weeks ago, and now we're going to make a big rectangular coffee table. And we're even going to leave ourselves with enough material to make a large third piece, maybe a desk or something. We're not quite sure yet, but we'll see. Yay. When choosing a layout for this table, we had to consider how big we wanted to make it and which part of the slab we wanted to use, which would then dictate how much epoxy we would need to fill in all the blanks. We're always wanting to highlight the natural beauty of the wood, so we used the upper section of the slab because there was a lot of nice crotch grain, and this was also the widest part, which means we could make the table the least narrow. We aren't really going for exact dimensions at this point, just kind of a rough idea of how the table will look. And this also helps visualize the areas we might want to fill in with more wood so we can use less epoxy and really make everything look as natural as possible. So why the hell are we making epoxy tables? Especially since we built a big slab dining table a couple months ago and we purposely didn't fill the open spaces with epoxy. And it's a little awkward because right after we finished that piece and posted the video, we started making the two epoxy coffee tables you're seeing, and we were getting a bunch of comments at the same time on the dining table video about how much people loved that the table was epoxy free, which made us think people might hate these. The thing is, we really like the way these tables came out, and honestly, we look at them as slab tables and not so much as epoxy tables. The epoxy is just there to fill in the gaps, and honestly, we just like trying new things Neither of us have done this sort of table, and we wanted to take a stab at it and see what all the fuss was about. But regardless of how much we love them, we want to know what you think. Once you see how it all comes out, let us know if you love it or hate it. Because if you do love it, you can actually own it, because this one is going to be for sale. Sometimes when you screw up, you come up with an even better way of doing something. And this is exactly what happened when we built the form for the epoxy pour. With both the circle table and this rectangle table, we built the forms exactly or almost exactly the same size as the slabs that were going in them. And for the most part with these epoxy tables, there isn't really a need to be overly precise at this point. So for the most part, you build the form oversize, there's some epoxy waste around the edges, and it all just gets cut off later on. Because we're maybe a little more precise than necessary, what happened is that when we sealed the edges of the form to prevent leaks, it caused the slab to rest on top of the caulk, which meant there was a decent sized gap underneath the slab. So any saved epoxy from keeping the edges nice and tight is now gonna be wasted underneath the slab. We figured out though, that if we add a chamfer on the bottom edge, the slab will sit flat against the bottom and also tight against the edges. And that means we either saved almost a quarter of a gallon of epoxy around the perimeter or over a gallon of epoxy underneath. Either option is pretty good, one might be a little bit better than the other, but honestly, it's kind of like choosing between a bowl of ice cream and a bigger bowl of ice cream, because I would take either one. And on top of all this, the slabs are currently oversized, so this chamfer is going to be removed later on, or we're maybe going to add an even bigger underside chamfer. All I'm saying is that this chamfer shouldn't really affect the final outcome of the table, so I don't know why we're worrying about it so much. Something about woodworking that I've always enjoyed is the kind of figure it out as you go mentality. 
I used to get a loose design and just kind of see where it takes me as I build. Unfortunately, that mentality doesn't really work for these types of tabletops, or at least that's how it felt during the last few projects that we've built. Doing these epoxy pours is definitely one of those situations where you can use one of those cliche sayings like proper preparation prevents poor performance, something like that, because without being prepared, you're gonna just have a bad time. But luckily we were prepared and we didn't spring a single leak during the first pour, so we did prevent poor performance. And ironically, we were also prepared to spring a bunch of leaks. So I guess if you look at it that way, we actually did perform kind of poorly when it came to preventing leaks. I don't know. Does that make any sense? In any case, one of the difficult parts about building these slab projects is coming up with a base that works for the piece as a whole. We usually make tables that have a pretty plain top. So the base is almost equally as important as the top, if not more so in some cases. These slab tables are a little different though. Because every slab is so unique, there's already an obvious focal point. And for some of our older viewers, they know that we often sell plans for the pieces we build. So because of that, it's obviously impossible to do for this piece, or at least more difficult. But all that said, I don't want to hard sell you on this, but if becoming a better woodworker is something you want to do, go check out our furniture courses and plans. We're confident they can help just about anyone take their woodworking to the next level. So I'll put a link in the description. Like I said, check them out, watch some sample chapters, and see if you think it's right for you. So when coming up with a base, we're trying to figure out how to not overshadow the top, but at the same time give it something unique or interesting so it doesn't just look like we made a display stand for the slab or something like that. It's a little bit tricky to find that balance, and we might be putting too much of an emphasis on achieving something that isn't really as important as we think, but it's those little things that make all the parts work together and I think it's what really takes a good piece of furniture and makes it into a great piece of furniture. And you know what? I'm not even sure I achieved all that. I suppose that's up to everyone that sees it, but at the very least, I tried. I wanted a simple design without a lot of parts and shapes, but still with enough going on where it was interesting to look at and where it felt like it was adding to the piece instead of taking something away from the top. It was also pretty straightforward to build as it was really just a bunch of rectangular parts. Some actually got an angle cut onto the ends, so I guess it was rectangles and some parallelograms. We're no strangers to screwing up epoxy projects, so we've learned to mitigate our risk in different ways. And one way is to add epoxy in stages. We're using Total Boat Fathom Deep Set Epoxy, which is designed to pour up to two inches thick, so if we had wanted to, we were within the limits to do the entire depth of the slab in one pour. But like I said, we're no strangers to messing this stuff up. So we played it safe and did it in two pours, essentially doing half the depth each time. And to our surprise, every ounce of the maybe three or four gallons that we used on this table actually stayed in the mold. But don't let that fool you into thinking we didn't have any problems at all. Unfortunately, there is a cruel surprise waiting in that epoxy and slab mixture. The feet for the base might sound like a pretty unexciting part of this piece, but it's gonna get wild, so hang on to your hats. Because the bottom panel on the table is two separate panels with a small gap between them, I needed to make a lower foot with an integrated stretcher that would hold the two panels together. And because I needed to account for wood movement and create some slotted holes for the attachment, this was a great opportunity to work on my CNC skills, which isn't something I do very often. So I modeled a pretty overly designed part that I could cut on the CNC and I wanted that part to look good. The funny thing about this is that part didn't actually need to look good because it's purely for function and could easily be made without a CNC machine. But I had the opportunity to model something on the computer and have a machine cut it for me. So I just ran with it. And if we could get our eyes closer to the ground than maybe five eighths of an inch, then I think we could see it and it would all be worth it in the end. All right, I sincerely want your thoughts on this next part. So watch it and let me know what you think. If you saw the last video, you'll know the mistake we made because unfortunately we did the epoxy pours at the same time for both coffee tables. So that means we made the same mistake twice. So we thought we had done our due diligence when spraying mold release onto the form before pouring the epoxy, but it turns out we completely underestimated how much mold release to use, or maybe just how well it works in general. 
So I guess due diligence wasn't enough because we very quickly realized the slabs had fully adhered to the mold and it was now an epoxy and slab and melamine tabletop. I imagine on the next one we won't be so stingy with the mold release or maybe try something else. We actually got a bunch of good suggestions in the comments of the last video that we'll definitely be using to hopefully avoid this situation again. But unfortunately, we had to do the exact same thing as we did on the first one, which was completely pulverize the melamine off the slab. I'm honestly curious though, can anyone else think of a better way to take care of this situation? Not how to make sure the slab doesn't stick to the form. Like I said, we got plenty of good tips in the comments of the last video, but pretend you were in the same mm, sticky situation. How would you go about removing the melamine? At this point, we probably made the biggest pivot of the build. With the slab sanded flat and all cleaned up, we started to inspect what we were considering the top. As I looked at it more and more, it started to look worse and worse to me. Some of the rotten spots had soaked up epoxy and hardened, which was good, but at the same time, they looked really bad. So in an attempt to salvage it, I cut out the funky spots with a die grinder and carving burr, then we filled in everything with more epoxy in hopes this was the fix we needed. It was one of those get rich or die grinding moments. But sure enough, after the epoxy had cured and was sanded, I still hated how it looked. So I made the call to use the other side as the top, and luckily that side looked great. There was maybe a bit less drama or character on that side, but as a whole, I was stoked with how it looked compared to the other side. I'll admit that making furniture and YouTube videos for a living has made me kind of view something that I really do love more as a job at times. So whenever someone asks me what my favorite part of building furniture is, my cynical answer is finishing a piece. And I don't mean applying finish, I mean actually just being done. But during this build, I think I finally found my favorite part. And that's this step right here, taking a rough panel, or in this case slab, and finally cutting it to size and removing all of the rough edges. There's just something oddly satisfying about cleaning up all of those ragged parts. All right, is this table gonna fall apart because of wood movement? It's something I think a lot of people wonder about and something we get asked about a lot. It makes sense because wood does indeed move, though the amount that wood moves is often exaggerated and people sometimes imagine a piece of furniture is gonna fold up like a piece of paper if we don't compensate for it which isn't necessarily true, but we still need to think about how the wood is going to move in a piece. Because wood is an organic material, it expands and contracts mostly across the grain as things like temperature and humidity change throughout the seasons. And the wider a board is, the more dramatic this will be. So whenever we connect two pieces together with perpendicular grain direction, we need to compensate by allowing room for the wood to move. Because the vertical pieces on the base are only about 10 inches wide, wood movement will be pretty minimal, but by making the outer mortise slightly wider than the tenon, any tiny shifts shouldn't be a problem. For the connection to the top, which needed to be removable as well, I used some Festool specific hardware that I think is called Domino Connect. I've used these quite a few times before, they work great, and most importantly, they'll allow the top to be removed when needed, but are a perfectly sturdy attachment when the top is in place. You might have noticed in some of these shots that the edges between the panels have been finished in black. And that's something that might seem a little bit out of order because it is out of order. So it might also be a little bit weird that I'm gonna talk about how important order of operations is right now. Applying finish and cutting in edge details might sound like something I would do near the end of a build, but both of these things needed to happen before the base could be assembled because after the vertical panels are glued in place, getting black finish into the small gaps would be difficult and cutting the edge details on these parts would be almost impossible. So all of this happened before gluing the vertical pieces in place and attaching the top to the base. Hey, real quick, before we keep going, I wanna thank Warby Parker for sponsoring today's video. Warby Parker offers everything you need for happier eyes, eyeglasses, sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams, and you can shop with them online or in stores. This time, it was Chris that was getting new glasses, so he went on their website, took a quick quiz, 
and they gave him a bunch of options based on his answers. From there, he picked his five favorites, which they shipped to him for free, and he could try them on at home with zero obligation to buy. Here are the three pairs that he liked the most. Let us know which one you like the best in the comments. After you make your selection, glasses start at just $95, including the prescription lenses. So if you're in the market for new glasses, definitely try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. Order five pairs of glasses to try on at home for free for five days. There's no obligation to buy, ships free, and includes a prepaid return shipping label. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash four eyes. All right, thanks Warby Parker. We already talked about wood movement, but what about the slab top curling up like a taco over time? With slab projects like these, there's always a lot of concern about whether or not to reinforce the top with something to keep it as flat as possible over time. The last couple pieces we made with slabs didn't necessarily warrant doing this. Having a base design that acts as a natural call can help, and the relatively narrow slabs won't be as prone to cupping. But with this one being pretty wide, it made sense to do something here. And a little extra work to be sure the top stays flat seems like a pretty good trade-off. One little tip that might save someone a headache when doing this was the two lengths of C-channel we purchased were pretty different in width. So using the actual pieces to mark and cut the grooves was the best way to go. I initially marked them not knowing they were slightly different, but when I got the two pieces mixed up at one point, I realized they were only going to fit in the grooves that I cut specifically for each one. One of those things you wouldn't really know unless you actually do it. One thing I'm probably in the minority about is that I've never really enjoyed the finishing process in any build. Finishing can be a little finicky and time consuming, but I have to say these slab projects have maybe changed my outlook a little bit. First, there's something very satisfying about spraying black polyurethane on red oak. I'll freely admit that. But also putting finish on these big slab tables has brought me slightly closer to really loving this final step. Maybe it's the type of wood we're using, which is elm, or maybe it's the finish, Rubio Monocoat. But either way, seeing these slabs really come to life with that first coat of finish has been a very enjoyable part of the build, and hopefully it's just as enjoyable watching the video version of it too. So this project had quite a few pivots. Going all the way back to the beginning, the initial idea, if we had stuck with that, we would have ended up with a project that we weren't really happy with. We wouldn't have had enough wood to build the other pieces that we were able to, and we would have spent a lot more money on the amount of epoxy needed to complete the project. So if you ever have an idea in the middle of the night, then spend a bunch of money on it, only to realize the idea sucks. Just remember, there's always a pivot that can be made and if you try hard enough, you can take that bad idea and turn it into two pretty okay ideas. <laughs> 